Welcome to 365 Motivationals, where we explore the best books to help you unlock your potential and transform your life. Today, we're diving into Within You is the Power by Henry Thomas Hamblin, a timeless classic that teaches us the extraordinary truth about human potential, that each of us holds immense power within to shape our destiny and achieve greatness. Hamblin's message is simple yet profound. The key to success, happiness, and inner peace is not found in external circumstances, but within us. By cultivating the right mindset and tapping into our inner power, we can overcome any obstacle, transform our lives, and manifest our dreams. Let's explore the core principles of this life-changing book. Number one, the power of thought. At the heart of within you is the power is the idea that our thoughts are the most powerful force in our lives. Hamblin emphasizes that every thought we think is creative, shaping the circumstances of our lives. Whether positive or negative, our thoughts determine our reality. If we consistently think thoughts of lack, limitation, or fear, we will attract experiences that reflect these negative states. However, when we focus on thoughts of abundance, success, and joy, we align ourselves with the creative forces of the universe and begin to manifest positive outcomes. Hamblin encourages us to become conscious of our thinking and to take responsibility for the results we experience. By training our minds to think constructively and positively, we can bring about the changes we desire. It all begins with the decision to believe in the power within us and to use it wisely. Number two, overcoming fear and doubt. One of the biggest barriers to realizing our inner power is fear. Fear and doubt cripple our ability to move forward and keep us stuck in limiting beliefs. Hamblin teaches that fear is an illusion, a product of the mind that has no real power unless we give it power. He encourages us to confront our fears and replace them with faith and confidence. According to Hamblin, when we shift our focus from fear to faith, we activate the latent powers within us. By trusting in the infinite wisdom of the universe and the divine power within, we can move past self-doubt and step into our true potential. In this way, within you is the power offers a powerful message of liberation from the chains of fear that hold so many of us back. 3. The Power of Affirmation and Visualization Hamblin places great emphasis on the use of affirmations and visualization to harness the power within. He explains that by regularly affirming positive beliefs about ourselves and visualizing our desired outcomes, we reprogram our subconscious mind to attract success and prosperity. When we say affirmations such as, I am successful, or I have the power to achieve my goals, we are planting seeds of success in our minds. Visualization adds even more power to these affirmations by allowing us to mentally picture the life we want to create. This process helps us align with the energies of success, bringing us closer to manifesting our dreams. Hamblin assures us that by using these techniques consistently, we will start to see real, tangible changes in our lives. Our thoughts, beliefs, and visualizations become the blueprint for the reality we experience. 4. The Role of Persistence in Action While within you is the power teaches the power of thought, Hamblin also emphasizes the importance of persistence and action. It's not enough to think positively, we must also take decisive action toward our goals. Hamblin reminds us that we have an active role to play in the creation of our destiny. Once we align our thoughts with success and visualize our desired outcomes, we must back those intentions with consistent, focused effort. Hamblin's message is one of balance, a balance between inner belief and outer action. The thoughts we think set the course, but it is our actions that bring our dreams to life. He advises readers to remain persistent in their efforts, even when obstacles arise, trusting that the power within will guide them toward victory. 5. Inner Peace and Harmony Hamblin concludes his book by focusing on the deeper purpose of unlocking our inner power, to live a life of peace and harmony. He teaches that true success is not just about material wealth or external achievements, but about finding inner contentment. By aligning ourselves with the divine power within, we experience a profound sense of peace that transcends life's challenges. This inner peace allows us to navigate life's ups and downs with grace and resilience. As we learn to trust the power within, we cultivate a mindset of calm and assurance, knowing that we are always connected to the infinite source of wisdom, love, and strength. 
Conclusion Tap into the power within. Within You is the Power by Henry Thomas Hamblin is an inspiring guide to mastering the mind and unlocking the boundless potential that resides within each of us. Hamblin's teachings remind us that we are not victims of circumstance. We are powerful creators, capable of shaping our destiny through the power of thought, faith, and action. If you're ready to step into your power and transform your life, start by applying these principles today. Remember, the journey begins within. If this summary resonated with you, don't forget to like this video to help it reach more people. Leave a comment sharing your thoughts on the power of the mind. And most importantly, subscribe to 365 Motivationals for more inspiring content on personal development, success, and mindset transformation. Together, we can unlock our true potential. Within You is the Power by Henry Thomas Hamblin, read by Liam. Preface there is a power lying hidden in man, by the use of which he can rise to higher and better things. There is in man a greater self, that transcends the finite self of the senseman, even as the mountain towers above the plain. The object of this little book is to help men and women to bring their inward powers of mind and spirit into expression, wisely and in harmony. With universal law, to build up character, and to find within themselves that wondrous self, which is their real self, and which, when found, reveals to them that they are literally and truly sons of God and daughters of the Most High. There is no way whereby the discipline of life can be avoided. There is no means by which fate can be tricked, nor cunning device by which the great cosmic plan can be evaded. Each life must meet its own troubles and difficulties, each soul must pass through its deep waters, every heart must encounter sorrow and grief. But none need be overwhelmed in the great conflicts of life, for one who has learned the great secret of his identity with the universal life and power, dwells in an impregnable city, built upon and into the rock of truth, against which the storms of life beat in vain. While this little work does not offer any vain promises of an easy life. For, if this were possible, it would be the greatest of all disasters, but rather endeavors to show how to become so strong that life looks almost easy by comparison, the life or fate does not change or become easier, but the individual alters and becomes stronger, yet, it does show the reader how to avoid making his life more difficult than it need be. Most people's lives would be less filled with trouble and suffering if they took life in the right spirit and acted in harmony with universal law. It is hoped that this little book may help many to come into harmony with life's law and purpose and thus avoid much needless suffering, to find the greater self within, which discovery brings with it a realization of absolute security, to bring into expression and wisely use their inner spiritual and mental forces and thus enter a life of overcoming and almost boundless power. Chapter 1. Infinite Life and Power. Man possesses, did he but know it, illimitable power. 1. Thought is a spiritual power of tremendous potency, but this is not the power of which we speak. I thought, man can either raise himself up and connect himself with the powerhouse of the universe, or cut himself off entirely from the divine inflow. His thought is his greatest weapon, because, by it he can either draw on the infinite or sever himself in consciousness, but not in reality, from his divine source. This power is of the spirit, therefore, it is unconquerable. It is not the power of the ordinary life, or finite will, or human mind. It transcends these, because, being spiritual, it is of a higher order than either physical or even mental. This power lies dormant, and is hidden within man until he is sufficiently evolved and unfolded to be entrusted with its use. Through the divine spark within him, which is really his real self, man is connected with the infinite. Divine life and power are his, if he realizes that they are his. So long as he is ignorant of his oneness with the divine source of all life, he is incapable of appropriating the power. That is really his. If, however, he enters into this inner knowledge, he 
finds himself the possessor of infinite power and unlimited resources. This power, then, is God's, yet it is also man's, but it is not revealed to him until he is fit to be entrusted with it. It is only when man realizes his oneness with his divine source that he becomes filled with its power. Many teachers and initiates lament the fact that certain secrets are being spread broadcast today, secrets that, in the past, were kept closely guarded. They fear that unillumined and unevolved people may make destructive use of spiritual power. This, to the writer, appears to be improbable. It is true that strong personalities, who have a great belief in their own power to achieve and succeed, draw unconsciously on hidden powers, and thus are able to raise themselves high above their fellows. The use, however, that they can make of spiritual power for base purposes is limited, and is not to be feared. There are others, of course. One the powers of the subconscious mind are dealt with in other chapters. The powers of the spirit are far greater and finer than those of the subconscious mind who are misusing their powers. These are black magicians, and while they may do a certain amount of harm, they become reduced, ultimately, to beggary and impotence. There are also others who spend the whole of their spare time searching for knowledge of this very subject. They read every occult book they can lay hands on, but they never find that for which they seek. There are spiritual powers and influences that withhold the eyes of the seekers from seeing until they are ready for the revelation. When man, in his search for truth, has given up all selfish striving after unworthy things and has ceased to use his self-will in conflict with the greater will of the whole, he is ready for the revelation of his oneness with the infinite. Yielding implicitly to the will of the whole may seem, to the unillumined, an act of weakness, yet it is the entrance to a life of almost boundless power. Man is not separate from his divine source and never has been. He is, in reality, one with the infinite. The separation which he feels and experiences is mental, and is due to his blindness and unbelief. Man can never be separated from spirit, for he himself is spirit. He is an integral part of one complete whole. He lives and moves and has his being in God. Universal, omnipresent spirit, and God, spirit, dwells in him. The majority of people are unaware of this intimate relationship with the divine, and, because they are unaware, or because they refuse to believe it, they are, in one sense, separated from the inner life of God. Yet this separation is only in their thoughts and beliefs, and not in reality. Man is not separated and never can be, yet so long as he believes that he is separate and alone, he will be as weak and helpless as though he actually were. As soon as man realizes the truth of his relationship to the infinite, he passes from weakness to power, from death unto life. One moment he is in the desert, afar off, weak, separate, and alone, the next, he realizes that he is nothing less than a son of God, with all a son's privileges and powers. He realizes, in a flash, that he is one with his divine source, and that he can never be separated. He awakens also to the fact that all the power of the infinite is his to draw upon, that he can never really fail, that he is marching on to victory. It will thus be seen how great is the power of man's thought. While thought is not the power of the spirit, it is the power by which man either connects himself up with the infinite power, opening himself to the divine inflow, or cuts himself off and separates himself from his spiritual source. Thus, in a sense, man is what he thinks he is. If he thinks he is separate from God and cut off from his power, then it is as though this were really the case, and he is just as impotent and miserable as though he actually existed apart from God. On the other hand, if he thinks and believes that he is one with the infinite, he finds that it is gloriously true, and that he is really a son of God. 
if he believes and thinks that he is a mere material being, then he lives the limited life of a material being and is never able to rise above it. But if, on the contrary, he thinks and believes that he is a spiritual being, then he finds that he possesses all the powers of a spiritual being. Again, if he thinks that his work is difficult and that he is not equal to his tasks, he finds that really his tasks are difficult and beyond his powers. Yet on the other hand, if he believes his work is easy, or, at any rate, within his powers, he finds that such is the case, and that he can do his work with ease. The power within is infinite, for, by faith in it, man is directly coupled up with the spiritual power of the universe. The divine spark within him connects him to the sacred flame, thus making him potentially a God in the making. A change then, must take place within man before he can enter into his divine inheritance. He must learn to think after the spirit, i.e., as a spiritual being, instead of after the flesh, i.e., as a material creature. Like the prodigal son he must come to himself and leave the husks and the swine in the far country, returning to his father's house, where there is bread of life enough and to spare. Chapter 2 The Overcoming of Life's Difficulties The true object of life is that man may attain wisdom through experience. This cannot be accomplished by giving in to the difficulties of life but only by overcoming them. The promises of God are not made to those who fail in life's battle, but to those who overcome. Neither are there any promises that man shall have an easy time and be happy ever afterwards. Yet, it is after this that the majority of people are forever seeking an easy life, a good time, freedom from suffering and care. But, in spite of all their seeking, they can never find that which they desire. There is always a fly in the ointment of their pleasure, something that robs them of true happiness, or, possibly, combinations of circumstances conspire to upset all their plans. Life is a paradox, the true object of life is not the attainment of happiness, yet if we attain the true object of life we find happiness. Those who are ignorant of life's true purpose and who seek happiness high end Lo, year after year, fail to find it. Like a will o' the wisp, it forever eludes them. On the other hand, those who recognize the true object of life and follow it attain happiness without seeking for it. In times past, people have made God a convenience. They have thought they could drift through life, learning none of its discipline, and then, when in trouble or things were not to their liking, they could pray to God and have the unpleasant circumstances taken away. The same idea is prevalent today. People have left the old orthodoxy and looked to various cults and isms to get them out of their difficulties. They do not believe now that they can curry special favor with God by prayer, but they firmly believe that they can get what they want from the invisible by demanding it. They think that by this means they can have their own way. After all, by this they mean having a good time, with no unpleasant experiences, trials, difficulties, adversities. They are, however, merely chasing rainbows. The easy life they seek constantly eludes them, simply because there is no such thing. The only life that is easy is the life of the strong soul who has overcome. His life is not easy in reality, but appears relatively so because of his strength. It is impossible to have an easy life, and, if it were possible, then life would be not worth living, for the sole object of life is the building of character and the attainment of wisdom through experience. Life to all of us must always be full of difficulty, and it is to help those who, hitherto, have found life rather too much for them that this book is being written. What the majority are seeking for is an easy life, which they will never find, but precisely the reverse, and for them I have no message. But to those wise and awakened souls who are seeking for truth, no matter 
from whence it may come, and who desire to overcome life and its difficulties, instead of weakly giving in to them, this book, it is hoped, will bring a message. At this stage we cannot go into the subject of why we should meet with disasters and adversity in this life, nor why some people should have apparently, a smoother life than others. The majority of people are drifters on the sea of life. They are wafted. Here and blown there, they are also carried hither and thither by every current. It is only the few who realize that they have the power of the infinite within them by which they can rise superior to all their difficulties, overcome their own weaknesses, and, through victorious experience, attain wisdom. We must therefore be satisfied to know that we have to meet trouble and overcome difficulty, and that it is only by so doing that we can attain wisdom and build up character. The question, then, is not whether we shall meet the trouble and adversity or not, but rather, how we shall meet them. Shall we be victorious or shall we be submerged? Shall we overcome life's difficulties? Or shall we give in to them? At this point some practical reader may say that attaining wisdom is all. Very well, but what he wants is practical help. He is perhaps out of work, has sickness in his house and is in debt. Or, he may be well-to-do, and yet in the deepest distress and misery. To all such I would say that they possess the power by which they can overcome all their difficulties, and through overcoming, attain wisdom. A man's success depends, more than anything, upon his faith, his faith in the good purpose of life, his faith in the power of the infinite within him and his ability to overcome every obstacle in his path. The extent of the power that man can bring into his life is the measure of his faith in that power. If his faith in it is small, then his life will be feeble and lacking in achievement. If his faith in the power within him is large, then great will be the power manifesting in his life. The power of the infinite is illimitable and inexhaustible, all that is required is an unquenchable belief and trust in it. The weakest and most timid can make use of this power. There is the same power in the timid and weak as in the brave and strong. The weakness of the former is due to a lack of faith and belief in the infinite power within them. Difficulties and troubles there will be in every life, and sometimes disaster and heartbreak, when the very earth slides from under the feet. Yet, by calling upon the power within, it is possible to rise from the ruins of cherished hopes stronger and greater through experience. Happiness and true success depend upon how the troubles and difficulties of life are met. Adversity comes to all, but if it is met in the right manner even failure can be made the stepping stone to success. Trouble comes to all, but, while it makes some people stronger and better in every way, it submerges others so that they never rise again. The trouble is the same, it is how it is met that makes the difference. Those who meet difficulty and adversity in the feeble strength of their finite minds and false personality are speedily overwhelmed and broken by the storms of life. But those who rely upon and have faith in the power within them can never be overwhelmed, neither can they ever be defeated. The power, being infinite, is always sufficient, no matter how great the need may be. One who realizes his own real spiritual identity knows that he can never die, that he can never be defeated, that he can never really fail. He may lose his body through the change that is called death, but he, the true man, can never die. Neither can he fail, though he be defeated a thousand times, he must rise again. Only have faith in the spiritual power within you and you can know all. The joys of overcoming and achievement. All things will become yours. Seek first the kingdom within you, your spiritual union with the infinite and harmony with the divine will and purpose, and all these things shall be added unto you. You will have no need to fear the morrow, for you will know that all provision has already been made. There will be no need to hoard up wealth, 
for there will be the necessary daily supplies. Always available. There will be no need to live near a doctor, for God, the infinite life, shall be your health. There will be no need for regret or lamentation, for you shall know that all is well. There will be no fear of future happenings, for you shall realize that the infinite one makes no mistakes. Chapter 3. Fate or Free Will? Great has been the controversy in the past, over the vexed subject of fate. Versus Free Will. On the one hand, fatalists claim that man is so closely bound to the wheel of fate it is impossible for him to live his life in any different way than that which is mapped out for him. He can bring a quantity of first-class evidence in support of his claim and believes in his theory with all his heart. On the other hand, the advocate of free will believes just as wholeheartedly that man is not bound at all, being as free as air. He, too, can bring plenty of evidence in support of his theory, which confirms him in his belief. Each one of them thinks that the other is wrong, yet they cannot both be wrong. Let us therefore examine the subject for ourselves, for it is an important one, being intimately connected with the subject which this book discusses. First of all, let it be said, they are both wrong, in part, and right, in part. Man is bound to the wheel, yet, at the same time, he has free will. Let us, therefore, explain this seeming paradox. It is an ancient truth of the inner teaching that man, when he is unevolved and before he is unfolded, is bound to the wheel of fate very closely. The unevolved man follows his desires, thus creating for himself a future from which he cannot escape. When, however, he becomes more Evolved and emancipated, he begins to resist following his desires and strives, instead, to follow higher things. This creates for him a better future and thus he becomes free in comparison with his former slave. State Man is a slave to fate as long as he is a slave to the desires of the earth plane. He is, however, free to overcome lower things and thus rise to higher. When he does this he ceases to create a painful future for himself and thus becomes free. There is, therefore, fate which is self-created. It is necessary to acknowledge this before we can proceed further. One who has not had much experience of life or who has not been a close observer may deny that there is such a thing, but one who has had great changes in his life against which he has fought and struggled in vain, knows that there is a purpose working behind the events of life, against which even kings and mighty men are powerless. There come times in man's life when he moves heaven and earth, figuratively speaking, prays until he can pray. No more, sacrifices, it may be, his money, his health, his prospects, and does everything that is in the power of a human being in a vain attempt? to stave off a threatened disaster. But, in spite of all his efforts, in spite of his cries to a pitiless heaven, the relentless march of fate cannot be stayed. It moves forward like a huge juggernaut and crushes his hopes. His dearest idol, his very life itself or all that then makes his life worth living and leaves him desolate. If then, you may ask, fate is so pitiless and so powerful, what can be? Done with it and where does free will enter into the matter? In reply it must be admitted at once that it is no use fighting fate. The more man fights it, the more completely he gets broken. There are certain main events in each life which must come to pass. These events and changes are inevitable and it is hopeless to fight against them. While these things, which constitute what we call fate, are inevitable and therefore cannot be avoided, it rests with ourselves how we meet these adversities and disasters. If we meet them in the wrong way they break us. If, however, we meet them in the right way we become stronger through discipline and experience, thus becoming better fitted to bear life's responsibilities and to overcome its difficulties and temptations. 
one who meets the setbacks, griefs, bereavements and disasters of life in the right spirit, becomes a strong and rich character. He becomes mellowed through experience, strong, stable, a helpful influence to all who meet him. When things go smoothly in life as a merry round, no philosophy or religion seems necessary, and as for an inward power, what of it, we can do very well without it. So say the thoughtless and inexperienced, but there come times in every life when not only is a philosophy and that a very sound one necessary, but also a power of which the finite self knows nothing is needed in order to raise the soul out of the dust and ashes of its despair. It is one thing to try and meet trouble and adversity in the right spirit and quite another thing to have the power to do so. One who thinks that he has no power within him but that all the power is in circumstances can never rise victorious over his troubles and become a conqueror over life's difficulties, but one who realizes that he possesses a wonderful power that can raise him up, no matter how crushed he may be, can never be a failure in life. No matter what may happen to him he will play the man and act a noble part. He will rise from the ruins of his life and build it anew in greater beauty and splendor. At this stage it is necessary to point out that there is a difference between big fate and the circumstances of life. Big fate as it sometimes is called antedates this present life and its cause does not come within the scope of this little book. Those who have studied the occult sciences may say what about planetary influences? They will point out that, according to the ancient science of astrology, a man's life is determined by the star under which he is born. This is true, if he gives in to the influences around his path. At Different times in his life man meets with influences that are sometimes favorable and at other times, adverse. These influences are, however, only influences after all, and one who will stand firm during periods of adversity and refuse to give in, relying upon the great power within to carry him through, will find that he can weather all storms of life and come out of his trials greatly strengthened. He cannot prevent these influences from coming around his path of life, but he can rise superior to them. He will meet with failures and setbacks but he will make of these stepping stones to success. He will experience griefs and bereavements, but out of these he will build a finer character and rise to higher things. One, however, who gives in to these things, refusing to rise. Sufficient if we say here that, through the ages, we reap as we sow, therefore our future depends upon how we meet life and its difficulties now. Big fate, then, cannot be successfully fought, simply because it is the working of omnipotent law, but our life generally and its circumstances depend upon how we meet big fate and how we recover from it. No matter how seemingly unkind fate may be, it is possible for us to make our life a beautiful thing. Inspired and energized by the power within, we can rise from the ashes of our dead. Hopes to build anew our life in greater beauty and more in harmony with the divine ideal. Those who have studied the occult sciences may say what about planetary influences? They will point out that, according to the ancient science of astrology, a man's life is determined by the star under which he is born. This is true, if he gives in to the influences around his path. At different times in his life man meets with influences that are sometimes favorable and at other times, adverse. These influences are, however, only influences after all, and one who will stand firm during periods of adversity and refuse to give in, relying upon the great power within to carry him through, will find that he can weather all storms of life and come out of his trials greatly strengthened. He cannot prevent these influences from coming around his path of life, but he can rise superior to them. He will meet with failures and setbacks but he will make of these stepping stones to success. He will experience griefs and 
bereavements, but out of these he will build a finer character and rise to higher things. One, however, who gives in to these things, refusing to rise again and reconstruct his life, condemns himself to further suffering, thus making utter shipwreck of his life. Let the despairing take heart again. Believe in the power within you and you will rise to heights before undreamed of. With this power to help you, you can accomplish the apparently impossible. Appendix to Chapter 3 Our life here is not governed by a capricious being who blows first hot and then cold or who favors one person and tortures another. The supreme being works through laws that are absolutely just and unchanging. Therefore all disaster and trouble in the life is the effect of certain causes. These causes are our own wrongdoing in the past, which set in motion forces, against which the power and wit and wisdom of man are powerless. Four. It will be seen then, that our future depends entirely upon the way we think and act in this life. Our future lies in our own hands. If we violate the law of love in this life, we create disaster and suffering for the future, which will have to be met, in the form of big fate of a painful character. Someday. Therefore, by right thinking and right doing now, we not only. However, because the fundamental law of the Universe is love, it follows that the working of the law of cause and effect is not vindictive. Its object is our highest good, viz. to bring us into union with the divine or in tune with the infinite. Therefore, by rising up to a higher plane and coming more into harmony and union with the divine, we rob even big fate of something of its power. We cannot oppose it, for by so doing we fight against omnipotence, but we can forestall it. By doing willingly, and of our own accord, that very thing which experience comes to teach us. It will be seen then, that our future depends entirely upon the way we think and act in this life. Our future lies in our own hands. If we violate the law of love in this life, we create disaster and suffering for the future which will have to be met, in the form of big fate of a painful character. Someday. Therefore, by right thinking and right doing now, we not only ameliorate conditions in this life, but we also create a future that will be more harmonious and freer than anything we have experienced hitherto. It is also necessary to point out that, even in this life, some of its big disasters are the result of thoughts and actions committed during this. Present existence. A youth or young man may commit a folly that brings, in after life, a terrible retribution. Or he may do another man a grievous wrong in years afterwards someone else does the same wrong to him. It is always an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth on this plane of cause. An effect, but the great way shower, by his teaching of the power of love, enables us to rise above these lower things and live a life of Harmony and Peace Chapter 4 Cause and Effect Man is the cause of the disasters in his life. He reaps through the ages. Exactly as he sows. Life is perfectly just and rewards every man according to his works. The fate of the present is the reaping of his sowing in, it may be, a distant past. Therefore, the disasters and sufferings of this life must not be attributed to the interference of a capricious and unreasonable God, for the truth is, they are due to the exact working of a perfectly just law. Fate, once created, is irrevocable. It can neither be fought nor evaded. By fighting against fate, man merely smashes himself to pieces. To do so, is equivalent to running his head against a stone cliff. The harder he charges, the greater the damage to his head, but the cliff is unaffected. Fate, although largely self-created, is really the divine purpose of life, therefore, to resist it is to fight against God. Fate, again is not punishment, in any vindictive sense, it is the drawing together of 
certain remedial experiences through which the soul can learn the lessons it has failed to learn in past ages and thus attain wisdom. The object of fate is the highest good of the individual, although it may entail suffering and painful experiences. Because the disasters in man's life are due to past wrongdoing, it naturally follows that his future depends upon the kind of life that he lives today. If, in the past, he has created for himself a sequence of events and experiences, from which it is impossible for him to escape, it is obvious that his future lives depend entirely upon how he lives the present one. It will be seen that if man can learn the lessons of the present life, and live in such a way as to cease creating trouble for the future, he is beginning to climb the path of liberation, which is the road. All advanced souls have to follow, or, rather, have the privilege of following. By following this path, man ceases to be bound to the wheel of fate. This little work does not teach reincarnation, but its teaching is based on a belief that man, in reality, is a spiritual being, a divine spark from the sacred fire. Spirit being immortal has no beginning or end therefore. Always lives. This present life is one of countless experiences, each one of which helps to build up character. There is no death, but only changes from one vehicle to another. There is no beginning, or end, or time in reality, these are mere limitations of the human mind. It is impossible for man to die, he can only leave his body. He cannot kill himself, try how he will he can only force himself out of his body. Man must always go on, whether he likes it or not, he proceeds through the ages, reaping exactly as he sows. We have already seen that man cannot avoid or fight successfully against fate, but that he can become free from the wheel of fate by living a life in harmony with divine law. 5. 5. This is the inner secret of all esoteric teaching. The new birth, or regeneration, means the awakening of the soul to conscious immortality. The old self, that was bound to the wheel of fate and the plane of cause and effect from which it could never free itself, owing to the fact that it was continually binding itself to the wheel afresh, through following selfish desires, dies, and a new self is born. In other words, the consciousness is raised from the plane of sin and death, of sensuality and desire, of Restriction and captivity, to the higher plane of spirit, where man realizes that he is a son of God. He discovers that the divine spark within is his true self. He realizes also that he has always lived in his real spiritual self. Beginning and end, like change and decay, belong purely to the material plane and have no place in reality. They form part of this present three dimensional existence but have no Reality. Endless being is the reality. Anything short of this is mere illusion. It is not necessary. Therefore, to believe in the theory of reincarnation or that all our experiences must of necessity take place on this plane. Sufficient to know that we can never die, that we cannot escape from ourselves. And that to neglect seeking with all our heart for union once again with our divine source is merely to prolong our sufferings. At this point it is necessary to point out that most of man's troubles are not caused by fate at all, but are due to his fighting against or trying to resist the great plan. If the experiences of life are resisted, or an attempt is made to evade its discipline, troubles and difficulties will repeat, becoming more painful and insistent until their lesson is learnt and the life changed accordingly. Therefore man has it in his power greatly to improve his present life, as well as to create a far better future, simply by living his life today in harmony with divine law. Further, it is necessary to point out that all thought and action have an immediate as well as a far-reaching effect. It is true that the full effect of life here is not reaped until after our little course on this plane has been run, but great differences are affected in the present life. Nevertheless, 
the way a youth makes use of or throws away his opportunities either makes or mars, to a very large extent, his adult career. Opportunities, once allowed to pass, can never be recalled. Sins committed and wrongs done to our fellow men have an unpleasant habit of repeating themselves in a reversed way later in life. For instance, a man may get on in life and, in his selfish climb, may trample on one weaker than himself, ruining him and driving him to despair. Years afterwards, he will probably be treated in exactly the same way by someone stronger and more favorably situated than himself. Therefore, there is an immediate sowing and reaping that finds fruition in this life. By immediate is meant, within the compass of this life. The reaping may be delayed 10 or 20 years, but in the writer's experience, it not infrequently comes. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Those, therefore, who think that life is not just, and who whine and complain about the way they are treated, are simply increasing their own troubles. Until man realizes that the cause of all his troubles is within himself he can never do anything to remedy matters, because, obviously, the only thing that is required is for him to change within. Man has to become changed within before his life can be altered. His thoughts, his ideals, his attitude towards life must all become transformed. When this change has been effected, he not only begins to repair his present life, but he creates a fairer and nobler life for the future. Man, then, has to change his desires and aspirations, instead of being directed towards hate and evil must be transformed to love and good. Instead of wallowing in lust and selfishness he must lift himself to higher and better things. How can this be done? It cannot be accomplished by the finite man at all, but it can be achieved by the infinite power within. It is only when man realizes his oneness with the infinite and believes that omnipotent power is at his disposal that the spiritual power within becomes available. So long as man has doubts and fears or disbeliefs, this special power is not available. It is his, but his state of Heart and mind prevents him from either realizing the presence of the power or making use of it. Before the machinery of a workshop can run it, must be connected up with the engine room. In the same way, man, before he can live the new life, must become one with the infinite life and power. Entering this new life of power does not take away life's experiences, its trials, troubles and adversities, but the change within does prevent the creation of unnecessary troubles and suffering. Also even a so-called unkind fate loses much of its power to wound, for the higher man rises into union with God and infinite love, the less power it has in his life. It still operates, but it fails to wound so deeply, for man, seeing with illumined eyes, knows that it is good that has come to bless, and not evil. That has come to slay. Painful fate loses its power to hurt when man ceases to resist it and meets it with open arms, seeking to learn the lessons that it has to teach. Chapter 5 Success What is meant here by success is the achievement of something worth. While, that shall make the world better and richer, and add something to the common good. Our sphere in life may be very humble, but if we overcome our own weaknesses, help others along life's pathway, and do our daily work better than we need, our life cannot be other than successful. If, at the end of our life, we can be thankful for it, realizing that we have made the best possible use of it, we have achieved real success. Success, to the unillumined, may mean the accumulation of wealth and the winning of fame. Yet those who give up their lives to the acquirement of these things are the greatest failures in life. They gain wealth, it is true. But they find that their money can buy only those things that bring no satisfaction, that it cannot purchase for them any of the things which are really worth having. 
Success of this hollow kind can be won, but at too great a price. The greatest teacher of all once said, For what shall it profit man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What does it profit a man if he gets on at the cost of happiness, health, joy of living, domestic life, and the ability to appreciate nature's beauties and simple pleasures? Yet man must be a striver. He must be forever seeking better things and to express himself more perfectly. One who drifts through life, making no effort to rise to better things, is not worthy of the name of citizen. Man, if he is to be worthy of the name, must be forever striving, overcoming, rising. Failure in life is always due to weakness of character. It is only strong characters who can resist the buffetings of life and overcome its difficulties. The man who would make his life worthy of respect and who would rise to high achievement and service will be confronted by difficulty at every turn. This is as it should be, for it weeds out the weaklings and unworthy aspirants and awards the spoils to those who exhibit faith, courage, steadfastness, patience, perseverance, persistence, cheerfulness, and strength of character, generally. Success, especially material success, is not, in itself, of much benefit to the one who wins it. It does not satisfy for long, but it is valuable in other ways. For instance, success, based on service, is a benefit to the community. If it were not for successful people of this type the ordinary man in the rut would have a bad time. Also, the winning of success builds up character. One who would be successful in the battle of life must be prepared to be tested and tried in every possible way. One who survives them all is built up in character in almost every direction. Even in his success, however, he will be tempted and tried. One who is engaged in the harsh struggle of business or who takes part in public life may, if he does not watch himself very carefully, become hard and callous. Of all failures this is probably the worst. One who succeeds in other directions and becomes a hard man is, after all, a sorry failure. Again, people of the successful, striving, climbing type are tempted far more than those who are afraid to venture and who remain in the valley of mediocrity. This is true, not only of those who seek to climb the steep path of spiritual attainment, but also of those who are successful in mundane affairs. In each case, they have placed in their keeping great powers and influence such as the ordinary man little dreams of. This is a grave responsibility, for if these powers are used for self-aggrandizement, the results are disastrous. Thus, those who climb are beset on all sides by temptations of a very subtle kind, which, if yielded to, will ruin the life and do grave injury to the soul. Life is a continual battle. To the ordinary person it is generally a fight with circumstances and the ordinary difficulties of life which are very important in his eyes. The more advanced soul is not troubled much by these things, he rises above them, but he is tempted and try to a much greater degree, and in a far more subtle manner. Those who think that by following a certain cult or ism, they will be able to have an uneventful walk through life are merely deluding themselves. As he learns to overcome the difficulties of life which baffle the ordinary individual, he will be tempted and tried in other and more subtle ways. This is because life is not for mere passing pleasure, but is for the building up of character through experience. Therefore, one who would succeed must be strong and wise and patient. Those who aspire to make their lives really worthwhile, who desire to serve their fellows more perfectly, who want to build up character through experience and overcome all their weaknesses, inherited or otherwise, must look within for power and wisdom. It must be pointed out, however, that man must not use his spiritual powers for selfish purposes and self-aggrandizement. There is an immutable law, 
which has been known to the inner teaching all through the ages, that forbids the use of spiritual powers for the creation of wealth or even of daily bread. Jesus was subject to the same spiritual law, and was tempted exactly in the same way as we. The tempter said, Command this stone that it be made bread. If Christ had turned the stone into bread, he would have failed in his great mission, but he knew the law. There are thousands of people today who are trying, not only to turn, by the misuse of their spiritual powers, stones into bread, but also into motor cars, fat bank balances and lands and houses. Such are heading to disaster, for they are working against the combined spiritual power of the universe. The enemy of souls offers those who have learned to tap the inexhaustible power of the universe and who have discovered that they are sons of God, wealth, power, pomp, the applause of men, the glittering things that perish if only they will misuse their God-given power. Like Jesus, they must refuse. They must put service before self and give instead of grasping. Thousands are being taught today to force their human will upon life and to use occult powers for the acquisition of wealth and power. They are taught to enter the silence and demand what they want. How to get what you want is the slogan of these modern teachers. Not merit, not service, not giving, but demanding, compelling by human willpower and by the use of occult forces. This is another device of the enemy of souls, and it is taking tens of thousands of seekers for truth out of the path. This subject is dealt with more fully in a separate chapter. If, however, man's ambition is to serve and to give, instead of to grasp, and to grab, if, also, he seeks success through merit and not through the misuse of his spiritual powers, he can go forward and the power will go with him and will help him. When once the power has been aroused, man must cease all purely selfish striving, although, of course, there will still be much selfishness in his motive. He must seek his success through service and through following noble aims, through merit and affair. Exchange, instead of trying to wring success from life, no matter who may suffer thereby. Further, when this power has been brought into expression it must only be used in love, for if it used otherwise it will destroy the user. Again, the Power must not be used by the finite human will, but an endeavor must be made to find what the will of the whole is, and to work in harmony with it. Behind each life is the divine will and purpose. Each life is perfect as it is imaged in the universal mind. The highest success, indeed, the only true success, is to live the life according to the great cosmic purpose, or in other words, as it is imaged in the one mind. Do not imagine, however, that it is the will of the universal mind that man should be a failure or lacking in achievement. Far from it, for we have only to contemplate the universe to see that the infinite mind is for ever achieving in that it never fails. Man, too, must succeed, but let him mix wisdom with his ambition and work for the benefit of the whole rather than for any purely selfish purpose. It is natural for man to get on in life, to a moderate extent. 6. The writer's experience has been that it is necessary that we should always be progressing, achieving, overcoming and endeavoring to succeed. One of the greatest laws of the universe is progress, therefore it is fatal to stand still. We must go forward, we must achieve, we must accomplish things. If we do so, we may find that many things which cost us much effort and hard work are not worth the having, yet all the time. We are learning, through experience, and are being strengthened and prepared for greater things. Through repeated failure to find true satisfaction we arrive finally at true knowledge, wisdom and understanding. We are wise then, if, with the world at our feet, we can be satisfied with a very moderate material success, and turn our attention and aspirations to higher and better things. 
In concluding this chapter let it be pointed out that success and achievement will not drop ready-made from heaven into your lap. All who succeed are gluttons for work, toiling whilst others play and sleep. All teaching to the contrary is erroneous. To think that success is going to come to you when it is unmerited, simply because you make use of affirmations or employ mental treatments, is folly of the first water. On the other hand, to use the inner forces in an occult way, so as to compel material things or success, so-called, in any shape or form, to come to you, is black magic. One who stoops to such practices becomes a black magician, earning for himself a terrible retribution. There is only one way to succeed in the affairs of life, and that is by raising oneself to greater usefulness and service. By doing things better than they have been done before, by bearing greater responsibility, you serve humanity better, and therefore merit success. It is more blessed to give than to receive, said the Master, and this is true even in the practical and material affairs of life. First, you must give better and more valuable service, in other words, deserve and merit before you expect to see it materialize. You must sow before you can reap, you must become too big for your present position before you are capable of occupying a larger one. You must grow and expand in every possible way, and as you grow, so will your success increase. Outward success is only a reflection, so too. Speak of what you really are and a result of greater and more valuable service to humanity. It requires great effort and determination to get out of the rut, but so long as your ambition is not ignoble or selfish, there will be found within you power sufficient for all your needs to win success either in the hurly-burly of life or the more difficult path of spiritual progress demands imagination, vision, courage, faith, determination, persistence, perseverance, hope, cheerfulness, and other qualities. These are all to be found within. All these qualities lie more or less dormant within, and can be called into expression if we believe that infinite power is ours. Again, however, must the warning be repeated that this power must not be used for selfish self-aggrandizement, still less may it be used, or rather, misused, either to influence or dominate others. If this power is Misused the results are terrible and disastrous. Therefore, use the power only for the achievement of good and noble aims and in service, which shall enrich the life of your fellows, adding to the common good. Having arrived at this stage you must go forward. There can be no holding back. Ever onward, the divine urge is sending you to greater achievement and accomplishment. Just as surely as the planets must revolve round the sun and fulfill their destiny, so also must you go forward. See to it, then, that your aims and ambitions are based upon eternal wisdom, for upon this does your whole future depend. Chapter 6 Health It is impossible, in a little work of this description to explain why it is that one person inherits a weak and ailing body and another enjoys a Strong and robust constitution. Sufficient for us here to notice that the days of rude, rugged health are passing, and that man is becoming more highly strung, nervous, and psychic in his makeup. The old type of rude, unconscious health was due to the animal like nature of man, which caused his body to be governed more completely by the instinctive mind. Less evolved humans are not affected, apparently, by the mental storms psychic changes, and spiritual disharmonies that disturb the health of the more evolved types. We have an illustration of this in the case of some forms of insanity. The patient goes out of his mind with the result that his bodily health becomes wonderfully good. The instinctive mind takes control of things, and rude, robust animal health is the result. When the patient was sane and his mind filled with worry, ambitions, plans, cares, lusts, hates and griefs, he was probably very far from well. 
This would be due to the disturbing effects of his thoughts and uncontrolled emotions. When, therefore, his conscious mind gave way and he became happy in an imbecile way, he ceased to think of these disturbing things, with the result that the instinctive, animal mind was able to work undisturbed. It is of no use sighing for the good old times when people were rugged and strong in the way that savages are rugged and strong, for evolution has decreed that man shall change into a higher and more nervous and sensitive type. In this sensitive type wrong thoughts and emotions quickly produce pain and suffering. The majority of people do not know what good health is. Not only do they suffer from minor ailments such as headaches, indigestion, rheumatism, neuritis, but they also never feel hearty or completely well. They are strangers to the joy of living. Life does not thrill them, nothing quickens their blood, they have no moments of vivid ecstasy, in other words, they do not live, they merely exist at a poor dying rate. Again, the majority of people are susceptible to infectious diseases and epidemics, yet, if they were really well, they would be immune. Instead, however, of seeking immunity through health, they are seeking it through the use of vaccines and serums, thus adding to the burdens which the body has to bear. All attempts in this direction are bound to end in failure, for, as fast as one disease is suppressed another one will appear. Many people look upon disease and sickness as inevitable, yet the truth is that health is the normal state and ill health an abnormality. In tracing back ill health to its source, we find, first of all, that it is due to disobedience of natural law. Large numbers of people break nearly every known natural law of health and are surprised that they become ill. Yet, the wonder is that they are as well as they are. Yet, while obedience to nature's laws and the use of nature cure methods will carry us a certain part of the way, we find that there must be causes even deeper than those which are physical. We are confronted by the fact that there are many people who obey every known physical law of health, who bathe, exercise, breathe, eat and drink scientifically, who adopt nature cure methods instead of drugs and serums, who yet cannot find health. Therefore we must search deeper and go to the mind in order to discover the cause of ill health. When we look to the mind we find a prolific cause of sickness. Man thinks himself into ill health and disease. It is well known that thinking about disease and sickness produces them in the body. People who are forever thinking about disease, illness, operations and other morbid subjects become a prey to these things. Those who believe that sickness is inevitable manifest it in their life. Morbid thinking produces a morbid state of the body causing it either to fall an easy prey to infection or to break down into chronic ill health or even disease. Allowing the thoughts to dwell upon morbid things is a sure way to sickness and invalidism. Man is not only made ill by his own negative thoughts and emotions, he is also under the hypnotic spell of the race mind. The god of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. We are all under the spell, more or less, of a huge illusion. The evil, disease, sickness and other imperfections that we see and experience have no reality in reality, but have an existence in unreality. Although they are not real in a real sense, yet they are terribly real to this present limited consciousness. By realizing the truth, and by thinking and living in its Light and power, the hypnotic spell becomes broken, not completely, else. We should not grow old, but to such an extent that a state of greatly improved health can be enjoyed. We are also hypnotically affected by suggestion, which reaches us from a thousand different sources. The conversations of friends and acquaintances affect us adversely. Their belief in disease and sickness as Realities, and in its inevitableness, colors all their conversation, and 
Unless we guard against it, this unconsciously affects us. Newspapers, magazines, books, all steeped in the same error, also influence us unless we have become too positive to be affected. From innumerable sources it is subtly suggested to us that disease, sickness, infection are realities that cannot be evaded and to which we are prone. The effect of all this, putting it in simple and elementary language, is to divert the life power into wrong channels, thus producing disease and ill health in place of perfection. The normal state of health has to give place to an abnormal state of disease or sickness. The normal health state is, however, restored when truth is realized, 